Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to talk to you this morning about change. And in particular, I would like to talk to you about two main things. The first thing is that we are now living in the middle of a mass extinction event. That's kind of bad news. <laughs> the good news is that life will go on, at least for some species. But what species? And it's studies carried out by paleontologists and evolutionary biologists that study what has happened over the last 4.5 billion years of life on our planet. It's those studies that give us some indication as to who's going to be successful through this next mass extinction event. And so I'm going to ask you to think about life in a slightly different way than we're used to. We normally have a human-centric view of life and we like to think about our lifespan. But instead this morning I'd like you to think about life in terms of hundreds of millions of years. And I'd like to begin by perhaps taking you back just 250 million years, okay? So just a short step back in time. And our planet looked really different to what it looks today. In actual fact, our plea from Alaska through India and on to Australia without ever meeting an ocean. But this change, tectonic plate movements, caused these massive shifts in where those countries and continents are. And if you look over the last 100 million years, look at India. It's flying up from the, the southern hemisphere and it's crashing into that newly formed Asian landmass with such force that it creates the Himalayan mountain range, some of the highest mountains in the world. And so our planet has changed dramatically, even before 250 million years ago, and it continues to change today. Those plates are still moving and countries are still moving um, on a scale of about two centimetres a year. Okay, But add that up over, even over your lifetime, and that's a number of steps even in your lifetime. And so all of that change has had an impact on the organisms that have lived on our planet. And if we think for a moment about perhaps just the last 600 million years of life. And here's a quite a busy diagram, but I'm going to give you the take home messages. Okay, so on the bottom axis, on the X axis here, we have present day on the absolute right. Okay, zero million years ago. And on the absolute left, we have about 600 million years ago. And on the Y axis, we've got biodiversity. Okay, so if you ignore the colours on this graph and just follow the very top wavy line, you'll see that biodiversity on the planet has changed dramatically over the last 500 million years. In fact, those five big arrows that you see on that graph represent what we call the big five in evolutionary biology. And the big five represent five mass extinction events that have happened in the last 500 million years um, in the evolution of life in that period. And what happens during a mass extinction event? Well, what happens is approximately somewhere between 50 and 75% of all species living on the planet at that time become extinct. Okay? And this has happened five times in the past. And what happens, you'll notice, after a mass extinction event is slowly the biodiversity starts to increase again, okay? So if we just focus on this period here, for example, which is um, the end of the Triassic to the end of the Cretaceous, don't worry about the funny words, it's about 200 million years ago to about 65 million years ago. The end of the Triassic was marked by a, a massive drop in the number of species and type of species on our planet, and the end of the Cretaceous, again, by a massive drop. So these are two big mass extinction events. But what happens in between is that line starts to increase. The biodiversity on the planet starts to recover. And it's only those species that survive the mass extinction event that can go on to diversify. So if we just focus on this little region for a moment, what's happening in there? What are the organisms in this particular period that are starting to diversify? Well, between about 144 and 65 million years ago, there was something very spectacular happening on Earth. For the very first time in Earth's history, we had flowers. Okay, that might sound beautiful and romantic, but actually it's quite important and significant in terms of biodiversity. Because now we had 
new food sources and new ecological niches, new places where organisms could live and feed. Okay? And around that time, we also had the emergence of creatures that look like the guy on the top left, this small, furry, nondescript, rodent-like creature. I would like you to introduce you to our most recent common ancestor, Yomia. Yomia lived at this time and was a scavenger, so ate whatever it could find. And it was about this size, um, and it was covered in fur. The other kinds of organisms that lived at this time include prehistoric birds, but probably what this time is most famous for are these guys. Okay, so this period in Earth's history is sometimes called the age of the dinosaurs, because during this period in Earth's history, these organisms diversified very rapidly during this time, and we had dinosaurs that, that took over very, very different ecological niches. That all sounds wonderful. We have a world covered in beautiful flowers and a diversity of animals. But what happened next? Boom. <laughs> An asteroid about 10 kilometers in diameter hit Earth just off the Mexican coast um, and the, at the Yucatan Peninsula. And it caused a crater in the Earth that's about 100 miles in diameter. Okay, so quite a significant impact. Within less than a second, that um, asteroid buried itself in the Earth's crust and spread up into the air plumes of smoke, steam and ash, as well as fragments of, um, of the Earth and of itself. And those fragments burned as they re-entered Earth's atmosphere and would have caused wildfires and boiling of the Earth's oceans. As if that's not bad enough, for those poor organisms that are trying to live at the time, it also would have caused shockwaves that have would have um, spread around the globe and caused massive amounts of volcanic eruptions and earthquakes. So a pretty tricky time for life. <laughs> In fact, 75% of all species living at that time were completely wiped out, okay? But that's not necessarily all bad news. I'd like to send a, a positive message out this morning. <laughs> With mass extinction comes opportunity. For those organisms that can survive the mass extinction event, they now have loads of new ecological niches that they can take over. All of those non-avian dinosaurs that have become extinct have left wide open lots and lots of ecological niches that these organisms can now diversify and expand into. And that is exactly what happened with our most recent common ancestor, Eomia. Eomia went on through many generations and multiple mutations to form a variety of animals that we recognize today as mammals, including us, from bowhead whales to bats, okay, and everything in between. And they all share a common ancestor back during that period. So the removal of dinosaurs from our planet gave mammals a really big advantage. And this era from 65 million years ago until now is what's called the age of the mammals because these were the animals that really did well during this period and produced a variety of different species. And so what exactly is happening when an organism takes over a new ecological niche? Well, this is what my research group are interested in, and we call it genomic archaeology. Because in actual fact, what's happening are changes in the DNA that make up that organism. And those changes in the DNA mean the organism can now live at a slightly different temperature or eat a slightly different foodstuff. And by examining the DNA of species, we can figure out what makes that species able to survive in particular environments or fit into ecological niches. And I'm just going to tell you two short stories now. The first story is about polar bears, and the second story is about hummingbirds. And so we published a paper last year on polar bears where we took um, 75 polar bear genomes, all the DNA from 79 individuals and from 10 brown bears, and we asked two questions. Okay, we asked firstly, when did polar bears diverge? Okay, we had no idea when they last shared a common ancestor with brown bear. And the second thing we wanted to know was, how did polar bears get their white fur? How is it that they can eat 
100% fat diet and not have cardiovascular related issues. <laughs> it sounds wonderful to be able to eat all the chips in the world. But they can eat 100% fat diet and have no negative consequence. So these organisms have adapted to an ecological niche. But how much time did it take them to do that? And so through that study, we found out that there are DNA mutations in polar bears that do not exist in any other mammal. They're specific to polar bear. Not only that, but they gave the polar bear a distinct advantage in his environment because they allowed for remodeling of his cardiovascular system. Okay, so polar bears have remodeled their cardiovascular system so they don't suffer the negative effects of a high fat diet. How long did it take polar bears to do this? We discovered that polar bears are actually a really new species. Polar bears are about 400,000 years old. So now I've moved from talking to millions to just thousands. They're very new and they have managed to have all of these adaptations to a high Arctic environment where temperatures can plummet below minus 25 degrees Celsius. They have done all of this in just 400,000 years. So organisms can become adapted to new ecological niches really rapidly. Okay. The second story I want to tell you about is a slightly different scenario. I'm going to talk about hummingbirds. And as we all know, hummingbirds are nectar feeders. But possibly what we all don't know is that the ancestor of all modern birds could not taste sweetness. Okay, So birds have lost the receptor that's needed to taste sweetness. But they can taste insects just fine. Okay, <laughs> So what happened that a hummingbird can now eat uh, nectar? I'm going to show you a little video here. And this is work that we published last year in collaboration with Maud Baldwin and others at Harvard. And you'll observe a little hummingbird here and a little experimental setup. So in my top cuvette, I've just got water. It's my fake flower and it's just got water in there. A couple of tongue flicks and the hummingbird is like, this is not worth my while. There is no caloric or nutritive value in here. So he's able to assess what's in the liquid by flicking his tongue. He moves on to my second flower. Now my second flower here has sucrose sugar, okay? And you'll notice, after checking us out for a second, <laughs> that he gets quite excited by what he finds in here. And he'll continue to feed and feed and feed while I continue to talk, because he's actually able to taste sweetness. How is it that an organism without a sweet receptor can taste sugar? He had a massive genetic disadvantage to fill when he decided to move to this ecological niche. What he actually did was he took Hummingbirds took the receptor for tasting insects, okay? And through point mutations over time in their DNA, changed that receptor so that now it can identify sugar, okay? My point here is that organisms can and do take over a new ecological niche even when the genetic odds are stacked against them, okay? So organisms can adapt to new ecological niches and we see that at the end of mass extinction events we have these bursts in biodiversity from those species that survived the mass extinction event. And I should say congratulations to everyone in the room because you are a descendant of organisms that have survived every single one of the past big five. Okay, so well done. You are a survivor. <laughs> <laughs> but where are we right now? Well, right now, we are in what is lovingly being called the fabulous Anthropocene era. And it's called the Anthropocene era because it is the era in the history of life on our planet when we, our human activities, are having the greatest impact on biodiversity. Okay? So that may sound rather um, daunting, and it should. And in fact, in the last number of maybe 200 years, we've seen the extinction of 900 species. We currently have 20,000 species on the threatened list. And we are estimating that within the next 500 years, we are about to see the extinction of 75% of all species on our planet. Does that number ring a bell? That is exactly the same drop in biodiversity that we saw with the extinction of the dinosaurs at the last of the big five. 
So we're living right now in the middle of a mass extinction event. <laughs> but, but what does the future hold? Okay, so let's try and finish on a positive note. Um, well, what are the species that are most likely to survive this big six? Okay, well, we know from studies of paleontology and evolutionary biology where we've examined the patterns and processes of evolution over many millions of years. We know what organisms or traits of organisms are most likely to get you through your mass extinction event. And they are the following. Six easy steps to survival. <laughs> the survival guide. Bear Grylls would be so proud. <laughs> okay, this is actually um, scientifically accurate. <laughs> so it's important that you are small, okay? Small species require less food and less energy. So if you're small, you are more likely to survive. It also means that you are more likely to have a large effective population size or a large population that can mate and produce offspring. This is important. It also means that um, you are more likely to have mutants in your population. Okay, so big effective population sizes have lots of mutants. We're all mutants and a population full of mutants is a good thing because if the environment changes, some of the mutants in the population are more likely to succeed. Okay, if you're all clones, you could be wiped out very easily. So the, yay for mutants. And if you're small, you're likely to have more mutants in your population. So these are things that will really help you survive next mass extinction event. It's also good if you can produce many offspring and if you can do it really quickly, okay? So if you, can, <laughs> if you can reach sexual maturity really rapidly and also manage to produce during one cycle many, many offspring, fantastic. You've got an increased chance of survival. Best of luck to all the ladies out there. Okay, so it's also really great if you've got a wide distribution because if there are events that are happening on Earth that are affecting very certain regions and you're endemic to that one certain region, then your species is gone, okay? So it's important to have a wide distribution because it's not about survival of the individual, it's about survival of the species. So it doesn't matter if that area and that area of the population are gone as long as some manage to survive. It's also great if you've got a varied diet. If you eat only one specific thing and that one specific thing becomes extinct, okay. Now you've got a problem. You have either got to become extinct or quickly adapt to a new foodstuff. And we've seen with the evolution of polar bears and hummingbirds that you can quickly adapt to a new foodstuff, but not every organism can. Be free to move fast. That might sound obvious, but there are certain organisms that are not free to move fast. Think of coral reefs, okay? There are certain organisms that are really stuck to the environment that they're in. Um, it's also good to be um, calm and good in stressful situations. It's not that this mass extinction event is going to be caused necessarily by a 10 kilometer wide asteroid hurtling towards the Earth. That would be stressful. Um, <laughs> it's more likely that it's going to be um, a different kind of event that occurs, the kinds of events that we're seeing right now, the destruction of, of um, of various different areas of our planet. So what I'm saying when I'm saying be good in stressful situations, it's those organisms that can go for long periods of time without food or water, okay? Those organisms are gonna do well. The kinds of species I'm thinking about are reptiles, okay? Who can go long periods without eating or drinking and also hibernating mammals. They'll probably do well, they'll probably survive, okay? Um, also, organisms that are not really temperature sensitive. So if you can only be at this very precise temperature and if it fluctuates by one or two degrees, you can't survive, those organisms are unlikely to survive this mass extinction event. And organisms that need copious amounts of crystal clear water. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> unlikely to survive the next and uh, this mass extinction event. So I would like to thank you all for your attention and for being such a great audience. And I would like to leave you with this thought. Do you think we can tick these boxes as a species? Or can you think of a species right now that can't tick 
these boxes. And I will leave you with just one example, and that are the coral reefs. Okay, they are very unlikely. But have a think about it. Next organism you meet outside the door, ask yourself the question, <laughs> are you going to make it? <laughs> Hopefully it's not a human, because <laughs> that would be really cynical. But thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.